Have you lost control over your development sprints? Is Scrum just wild theory for you? And you're not if you're doing it right. Uh, today's guest is Saurabh Salimi, founder of Scrum Academy and a certified Scrum coach. He will guide us through the most common mistakes that startup teams make uh, when building software, and he will give us some helpful advice. Uh, Saurabh, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Victor, for inviting me. Yeah, uh, my pleasure. Um, how, how did you get into Scrum and being a Scrum professional? Oh, man. <laughs> that's, that's going to be a long story, but I tried to cut it short. <laughs> So um, initially, I actually never, so I studied medicine. I'm, I'm the only medical doctor in this field that has achieved the highest credentials in the world of, of agility. And I actually I finished medicine and I didn't really know which specialization to do. Um, I liked the intellectual challenges of being an internal medicine doctor, but that was just too slow, right? If you have a patient, you just give them a bit of drugs and then you have to wait till things come. And I like the action in surgery. And there's really no mix between these two things. So I was in the middle of a, of a debate internally in my head. And uh, one of the ideas that I had was also to look into other fields. As my parents were both entrepreneurs, I had this um, entrepreneurial neck uh, in me and I was like, okay, let's, let's explore this and let's look at the world of business and let's look at what kind of opportunities are out there. And ultimately, I joined Bain and Company, one of the three big strategy consulting firms. And I stayed at Bain for almost three years uh, before then my wife said, as long as you're working there, we're not going to have any kids because you're never at home. So I left Bain. I founded a company with a friend from school. And I also consulted my parents' IT consulting company on what could be like the next steps that they do. And as a startup founder, I obviously, in 2010, 2011, read the book Lean Startup. And for me, it was always like, why wouldn't you work this way? Because if you think about it, like basically every scientist, every medical doctor, it's clear that anything that we have in our head is a hypothesis. And what do we have to do with hypothesis is to validate them. We have to run experiments in order to understand to what extent this hypothesis is correct and to what extent it is not correct. So the lean startups really resonated with me. And at the same time, I was like, oh, this is very different to what most of the clients that I worked with during my time at Bain do. And it was also very different to what my parents' IT consulting company was doing and what was cons and consulting their, com their clients on. So I looked into this whole space and identified that connected to the lean startup, there's this upcoming topic of agile software development particularly Scrum. And together with my dad, we looked at this and said, maybe that's like the next thing that the company should focus on. And as part of that, of course, we had to like train ourselves, we had to train our employees, our colleagues, and, and then also look for clients that were looking into this particular thing. And as part of that, um, uh, this whole topic of agility, particularly Scrum as one framework to get there, resonated really well with me. And I just made it my decision to spend the rest of my career probably um, learning about this stuff, teaching people around this topic, and as part of this journey, ultimately became a certified Scrum trainer, Agile leadership educator, and all of that. And today I spend around 50% of my time teaching classes, running trainings, building online courses, and the other 50% I spent with companies, small ones, but also pretty big ones, on implementing these things in reality and then learning from that. And in the past years, I've had a lot of work in the software space, but more importantly, maybe, or, or more interesting for me, I did a lot of work in the non-software space. So building a truck or medical devices, participating in this COVID uh, um, uh, tests, etc. So um, it has been quite a journey and I'm still excited about the topic. Well, it indeed is quite a journey. So you started right with the roots of, of Agile and Scrum as well. Uh, I remember those days when nobody heard of it. It was like this yeah. big new thing. Um, and so when you when you consult clients uh, or you see different projects, different companies, different uh, maybe even uh, goals or, or, or circumstances, um, is Scrum always the right approach? 
Not necessarily. I mean, right is always relative, right? <laughs> so for me, it, it when I mean, the topic that I try to drive is the overall concept of being adaptive to the situations that you're in. And I think based on that, claiming that one framework, be it Scrum, be it something else, is always the right approach would be contradicting the overall philosophy that I try to teach people, right? And even within a framework like Scrum, what I really like about it is that there is this continuous improvement of the process as well. And as part of that, the framework. So to your question, no, it's not always the right approach. But I think what is one of the most important things and what could be considered as on a meta level as a right approach is the concept of empirical process control, where you are aware that you have hypotheses in your mind, as I mentioned earlier, and where you start defining experiments or designing experiments that can help you uh, uncover what the reality is and, and get better and better over time. That, that makes perfect sense. And so um, do you see that more and more people are taking this validation part outside of code and actual coding, uh, you know, but rapid prototyping or, or, or things like that? Um, to some extent, not enough, unfortunately. There is uh, this whole movement coming up about discovery, right? Because a lot of people associate agile ways of working primarily with delivery, right? The moment you know what you need, now you start to build it, build it in small increments and in sprints, and then you get it out of the door faster. I, I never thought that this would be the, the intention of, of agile or scrum as one of the frameworks in that space. For me, the discovery piece, and as you mentioned, uh, rapid prototyping helps you do that, like define smaller experiments to validate your hypothesis. Everything that Alex Osterwalder and his company Strategizer do around business model design and innovation, all of that for me is also part of the same philosophy, part of the same thinking, where as with as low costs as possible, you try to get validation on certain assumptions that you have. But um, not enough organizations, especially not enough big organizations, startups do this quite well nowadays. Because there's so much literature out there and the startup communities, people really challenge each other, as far as I can see. But not enough of the big organizations are aware of this whole discovery piece. They still believe that they know what their customers want. That's the assumptions that they still hold. And based on that, they're primarily looking at delivery options, not so much at discovery options. And so when we speak about discovery, then then uh, obviously uh, the one one hour session where you go over requirements, that's not the kind of discovery that you mean. No, no. I mean, if you do that with clients, it could be, but still probably not enough. But just within your team, going over a re requirement and creating clarity around that requirement and alignment, it's an important process. But that's not what we mean with discovery. With discovery, we really mean being aware of the assumptions that you hold and the hypothesis that you have, and then designing experiments with code or without code. Usually without code, it's cheaper to, to validate to what extent those assumptions are correct or not. And then inspect and adapt based on that. Mm, absolutely. And uh, how would you then look at com or compare uh, something like ShapeUp? to this model? Would you say it's actually aligned in that philosophy? It, it seems like it from what you're saying. Yeah, shape up, you mean the one from um, um, Basecamp? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I haven't looked into shape up in detail. To So this uh, as a disclaimer up front, but um, I've read a bit about it. Um, and based on what I've heard both Jason Fried and uh, David Heinemeyer uh, Hansen say, and others, and based on the work that they do with their products, I think they follow a lot of these things or, or they do a lot of these things in a really good way. They, to my understanding, again, not too much into it, is they do spend a, a fair amount of time on discovering what the actual problem is, the needs, 
how that can be solved from a both design and technology perspective, and then they implement it. And uh, I think they give themselves like six weeks sprints. They don't call it sprints, but it's more or less the same concept. And within this six weeks where you try to solve a certain problem, you have a lot of autonomy on how to solve that problem. All of that resonates very, very well with my philosophy. And I think there's a lot of overlap if you go beyond what a lot of the organizations have done with framework like Scrum, making it a mechanistic uh, uh, way of working. But if you really look at the essentials, at the, at the foundations of it, there's a lot of overlap with what, with what ShapeUp does. Again, I don't know enough about it. Yeah, exactly. I thank you because uh, that's exactly what it seems like that a lot of people when they think or hear Scrum, they really only start from the moment you break down things into a, a billion tasks, try to sort them on a backlog and then throw them at the next sprint um, and just mechanically work on them, which exactly. almost sounds like like waterfall uh to me at this moment um uh, not, not quite because you then get the flexibility but just from a planning perspective and here's my backlog and these are all the tasks that i need to do thank you uh planned up front right a lot of them are uh is what i see versus shape up where you have this shaping up phase of like we're putting back focus on this discovery thing um so this is this is yeah this is very interesting but now back to scrum maybe um why does everyone do Scrum slightly differently? Um, that's what I see from a lot of development teams. They miss out a few of the ceremonies or they, uh, they, they implement slightly different sprint lengths. Um, is that uh, how, how it's uh, supposed to be? Yeah, um, so Scrum, based on how I see it, and again, I, I don't have the expectation that I have the, the one and only truth. But the way I see it, the way I also teach it, it's intentionally a lightweight framework. So a lot of the criticism that I heard in the early days, especially from people coming from traditional project management, they were like, we need something similar to the pro uh, project management uh, not, um, body of knowledge, PM book, right? Which is like this thick. And I'm like, no, I think in the case of Scrum, it is intentionally lightweight. Now, the moment something is intentionally lightweight, it basically gives you a few constraints, but within those constraints, you have a lot of flexibility, a lot of autonomy, right? It basically gives you a canvas, but the type of picture you draw on it ultimately depends on you. Right? And I think for me personally, I think this is a good thing. Now, with regards to sprint length, it is intentional that teams can choose their sprint length. And now one of the questions that comes up is, so based on what should they choose, what their sprint length should be. And I always give them the two things. One is, what is the minimum amount of time that you can spend or that you need to spend in order to get a real product increment out? So something based on which you can gather feedback and learn. That's one. The other thing is, how much time can you invest before you actually get customer feedback? Right? Right? If you can go six months without getting customer feedback, I don't think anybody can really do that because worst case, you might have spent this six months working on stuff that nobody wants, right? And finding the balance between these two things is, is really important for a team. And whenever possible, I try to go into one week spurts. It makes it easy. Monday to Friday, you don't worry about anything over the weekend. Next Monday, you start with the next sprint. Most teams that I see work in two week sprints. And then there are a lot of frameworks around this. If you think about like multiple teams working on the same product, like Skate Agile framework, etc. And let's not go into the debate which, which of these are good and which ones are not. But the, they basically tell every team they need to have a two week sprint because then you have several of those two week sprints, you end up having a program increment, which is then ultimately three months. So the flexibility here, I think, is, is needed. The other reason is I think a lot of teams or people don't understand the reason behind the individual events or I think some people refer to them as ceremonies right why do these things exist planning still clear everyone probably runs a planning daily that's easy to do let's do this one the two things that are complicated and that a lot of teams 
don't do are review and retrospective. And from my perspective, from my experience, both of those are actually the ones where you get the value of a framework like Scrum. One is related to inspection and adaption on your product. So what are we building? And the most important thing about a review is that it's not the team giving feedback to itself. It's our stakeholders, ideally customers, giving feedback to whatever we have delivered. Because that's when we learn. And the intention of Scrum, the intention of the review, is to facilitate that learning process. And the retrospective is about learning about how we collaborate. And if we don't do that one, we probably won't improve over time. And both of these things, especially the retrospective, was also known as like the Kaizen in the Lean philosophy. Now think about how many organizations implemented Lean, but they never implemented a true pattern or a true habit of running regular Kaizens. But only then, if you do this, you get the real benefits of Lean and only then you get the real benefits of Scrum. So I think in most cases, it's not knowing why these events exist and why we should do them. Um, and therefore, they, they just skip them. And then it looks very different from team to team. That's that's actually very interesting. And so what does um, a review usually look like? I have like, my customer sounding board that I invite. I demo them what we developed and then we ask for feedback. Is that is that ideally how it should look like? That's, what, that's one way to do it, right? You have your customers, you demo something to them, and then they give you feedback. Another way is you just tell your customers what you have developed and then you let them demo it to you. Because in that scenario, you also see like, okay, how do they interact with my product? So one of the better examples um, from my own experience was when we were building a truck using agile ways of working, part, primarily Scrum, and we invited truck drivers. And one of the first increments that we had delivered was the cabin. And it was not like the developers or the product owner sitting in the cabin and telling everyone else how they can see things. We ask the truck drivers to sit in the cabin and share with us to what extent the experience sitting in this cabin is different from their regular truck cabin. So the, the more you can engage your customers, like a traditional product development, that would be a user acceptance test. But in a review, we're not asking about acceptance. We just want to learn. And we also want to observe the customer in the environment that we put them into. And the better you can create an environment, again, look at the review as an experiment, right? The better the experiment is designed, the more learning you can take from it. So customers being there, crucial, and then involving them as much as possible, even better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that makes a lot of sense. When you, when you think about the truck cabin, um, I think it... It just is just natural to let people sit in it and, and say what, what they think about it. But in, in software, we kind of have this urge to do demos. Like we do demos, right? Uh, we show it to people. We screen share. So that's actually a very fair point. Um, and now think about it. You just have to give them one of these devices. Okay. So try to book, I don't know, try to book a hotel. If, you, if you're running booking.com, ask your customer, try to book a hotel and then try to filter based on certain categories and try to do this and, and then you see how they do it and how intuitive it is to them and also you will see whether you run into certain bugs that you have missed etc but get the customer engaged as much as possible oh boy would they learn a lot from that um uh, <laughs> uh that's great and, and now to the retrospective what questions uh, should i ask my team hero or how, how would that look like ideally yeah so again going back to the intention. The intention is to continuously improve on how we as a group of people, as a team, collaborate and deliver value, right? So there are a lot of things you can now focus on from how we communicate, be it like verbally or also in a written format with regards to requirements or also other things. How do we engage in conflicts? How do we invite our customers in, right? How do we build the code? How do we write the code? Like the engineering piece of it. All of these different perspectives can come into a retrospective. Now, the 
crucial thing here is a providing a spray space and that's what a great scrum master or agile coach or however you want to call this person does right create the space where people feel safe to talk about problems and challenges that they've been facing right that's number one secondly prioritize those challenges and problems and then go into identifying the root causes some people use the five Y technique or whatever and based on those root causes come up with solutions to these problems and within each of these steps always focus because ultimately you don't want to get out of a retrospective with a long list of things that you could do you want to leave the retrospective with one or two things that you will do because if you don't do those things guess what the problems the challenges won't go away by themselves right they're not not just going to disappear and if you don't have this habit of identifying problems identifying solutions and then executing on those solutions at some point people won't see any value in the retrospectives because they will say oh we do this every two weeks we spend an hour or two we just talk and nothing changes so what you want is to make the change with visible because that results in improvement and sometimes everything you try is an experiment it doesn't go the way you want and then you can look at it in the next retrospective but build this habit of continuous improvement and this this from my perspective if i have to pick one thing and one thing only it's always the retrospective mm, mm. and i think you touched on a very very good point um here which which is um the the scrum master um whose job it is to give people that safe space who probably is I don't want to say the only person, but uh, you know, one of the few people who are actually motivated and whose whose job it is to think about this. Um, and a lot of organizations, especially small early stage startups, uh, don't have a scrum master. Uh, actually, the, the product manager equals the product owner equals maybe CEO. unintentionally the scrum master, the CEO, uh, the potentially the designer uh, or the developer or all of it. No, but now we're getting into too small of a team. But um, now, obviously, um, how important is the Scrum Master? I mean, it is important. But for example, in my own company, we're not that big. We're in total nine people, right? And we are split across multiple initiatives, circles, teams, however you, however you, however you want to call them. Now, in a team where I work with one of my colleagues producing content for our online courses, we're just two people. Do we need also a scrum master? Probably not, right? And we cannot afford it. And that's the thing that I see in most startups. But what's important is to understand that somehow we manage to create this space for continuous improvement. And part of that space is taking the time Another part is to work on things that we as a collective of people become better at addressing these problems. Now, what we decided as a company is on a regular basis, engage with an external coach and work on us as a collective. Some organizations might go and say, actually, we do have the budget to get a scrum master for our whole organization. That's also great, right? But not having a scrum master should never be an excuse for not pursuing this journey of continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. that, that makes perfect sense. Um, it, it, now I, I, I would like to move on to a, to a topic that I also see is, is very dear to a lot of people, um, which is estimations. Um, <laughs> And I think this is, I mean, this is obviously a can of worms and we could have uh, probably five other shows on this topic alone. Um, but Agile comes with its own way of, of as estimating, uh, which is not in ours, even though a lot of, a lot of people, most people actually still estimate uh, in ours. But um, there's the concept of, of points, right? Uh, can, you, can you explain a bit about that? Yeah, so... Again, a few steps back. Um, Scrum as a framework just says that 
items should be estimated. It doesn't say how. And the other agile frameworks, some of them are more prescriptive, some of them are less prescriptive. But it's not necessarily that one could say that agile always estimates in points compared to ours. Now, getting into this conversation about points and hours, it's an interesting one. I personally never understood why people would estimate anything in hours, right? Because, I mean, I understand why they do it, because they want to get some predictability. But the very first time that you do that, and then after a week or two, you look at how close those estimates were, you realize that they're probably not that close, right? And you see this with every project. And the bigger the projects get, the weirder or the bigger the gap between estimation and reality. So what we try to do is to fulfill the need for predictability, right? What is the problem that we want to solve? We want to predictably say how much work can be delivered in a certain period of time. Now, especially if you look at, the, at a team doing this and not individuals. So again, if you're, in, if you're just an individual, probably you can estimate in hours, depending on how well you know the task at hand and how well you know your own capabilities. Right? Based on that experience, you could probably estimate in hours how long it will take, tell, uh, take you to write a text or whatever, right? an article. But the moment you think about a team where not everyone has the same skill set, right? Not everyone has the same seniority, but as a team, you're now trying to make estimates, the whole concept of hours becomes irrelevant. Now, how do points help us? Points by themselves don't help us because you still have the uncertainty, like how many points do, do we get into a sprint, which is a certain period of time, a time box. But once you start estimating in points, which is something that you can really do well as a team, right? You then build the experience over multiple sprints. How many points did we actually deliver? Sprint by sprint by sprint by sprint. And then based on that, that's what we refer to as the velocity, you can make predictions into the future. Of course, every time your sprint length changes, those predictions become less reliable. Every time your team composition changes, those predictions become less reliable. So velocity as a point of experience is only so reliable as long as you keep things constant, the boundaries being the team and the sprint length, and more or less the type of tasks that they're working on. So if you take a software team and now ask them to build hardware, the velocity is not going to be any indicator that can help you predict the future, right? So all of these things taken into consideration, the velocity or the point system can help you get the predictability that you ultimately aim for without estimating in hours. This is great because what you're essentially doing is taking the hour out of the hour. People are still estimating the very same way as they would with hours. This takes one hour as compared to three hours. So this is three times more complicated, takes longer. But then um, what you can't do with hours is say that, I don't know, we have a 40 hour week, right? Uh, what you do with velocity is you would say, hey, we manage 30 hours in 40 hours. That's essentially what you're doing with Velocity. We're learning that our team can get an estimated 30 hours done in, in, in a week or an estimated 50 hours in a week. Uh, and you're abstracting that away and saying, oh, we're doing points so that it's not confusing. Is that basically what it is? It is to some extent. So the, the example that I give is usually if you go back 100 years from now, and you would ask someone, so I sit in Cologne, the next bigger city is, is Bonn. Like, how far is it from Cologne to Bonn? Probably they would have told you it's like one day of walking or like half a day on a horse, right? So instead of like the distance was measured in time, right? Until we came up with the concept of that's a meter and then thousand meters are one kilometer. 
Now, does everyone take the same amount of time to go through like a one kilometer race? No. It depends on who that individual is and it depends also what kind of tools they can use. If you have to run, it depends on like who's the fastest. If you have a car the co or a bike, the whole thing changes. And the story points to hours are the same thing as kilometers to hours. And velocity is basically how fast can you run within a certain period of time? And that's what we try to do. So take work as a concept and try to put an own dimension behind it that is not time and then see how much of that dimension can you get into a certain time box. Mm, yeah, it's just like in physics. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, it now, obviously, when we, when we look back at the first agile uh, uh, software teams, you know, what was most, most, uh, famous were these, these sticker boards and, uh, the post-it notes. And that was kind of the new thing. Um, now fast forward a couple of years later, things changed a lot, right? Even before people started going remote, but now even local teams had to go remote. Um, what tools, uh, especially during maybe discovery, because everybody knows the standard Jira board and issue tracker, but what tools do you really like that enable uh, Scrum in a remote first environment? Yeah. So anything that fosters collaboration and transparency. So for collaboration, I mean, all our whole team runs on Slack. Um, our developers, they use, I think it's called Tuple for pair programming remotely, right? Fosters collaboration. We have um, mural boards in order to, again, create collaboration. You can also take Miro, whatever, right? All of them are essentially the same. And we try to create as much transparency as possible, right? So having in process or in place that on a daily basis you get together, maybe instead of 15 minutes, now you spend half an hour because you also want to replace the water cooler conversation, etc. right? So any tool that can help foster collaboration and create transparency is super helpful. And once you put those things into place, people can work really well also in a remote session and they can work really agile in a remote fashion. But always ask the people. So I had no idea that there was a tool for pair programming remotely. But when the developers came up with it, hey, we would like to use it. All right, go use it. Because the cost of those tools in most cases is really negligible to the overall cost that you have and the productivity benefits that you get. And this is, I think most startups do this really well because they give people a lot of freedom around what kind of tools to use, etc. Most big corporations where you then have to go through like procurement and data security and all of that, for them, it's, it's really difficult to have everyone work remotely and still be productive and collaborative. Mm, absolutely. And do you have also recommendation on issue trackers everybody's kind of in jira do you have anything else you like or is it i mean personally i think they've 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 now gotten a lot better in the last years yeah. um but maybe you have something that you like yeah I, I think jira is great um for us many years ago we didn't use jira because back then they didn't have a cloud solution and as a small company we didn't want to have one person being in charge of hosting jira so we selected another tool. It's called Pivotal Tracker from Pivotal Labs. It's super simple to use. It just works out of the box. I don't know to what extent the functionality between Pivotal Tracker and Jira is different or what additional things you would get from Jira. We're really happy with Pivotal Tracker. Whatever, and my recommendation to people is always use whatever is already there. The tool is not going to make the difference. Using the tool in a systematic and disciplined way and ultimately building on top of it, having the collaboration, that's going to make the difference. So whatever tool is there, just start with it and, and don't worry too much about it. Mm. And what are the most common mistakes people make apart from putting too much focus on the tool? I was just going to say, putting too much focus <laughs> on the tool. No, so, but, but that's, so that's one thing. And the other things are putting too much focus on thinking about how to do things instead of doing things and then learning as you go, right? I cannot count how many, and that again, not so much about startups, but mostly big organizations, 
how much time they spent on designing the Agile initiative rather than just trying to do it with one or two teams and then learning from it. But that goes again back to the mindset that the people have. They believe if they just spent enough time up front, they can predict all the things that would come up and design a good solution. But that's not the case. They hold a lot of assumptions that need to be validated. So moving into doing, into the actual doing and then learning by doing, that's, I think, one of the most important things that organizations need to do. Mm. And you can always obsess about like, oh, how should we call this role? And how do we do this? And actually get into doing, right? Nobody cares about what this is called. And, but you will learn along the way how you differentiate between the different roles, right? And who takes which kind of decisions. That's so much more important than all this initial stuff that you do. That makes a lot of sense. And continuing with maybe mistakes that people make is a few pain points that I see some of the teams having. Uh, so, for example, um, when a team just has, you know, too many tasks in a given sprint and they, they're never able to finish, just there's no way. Um, what would you recommend to them? Take less. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> really, I mean, so... Uh, independent from whether you're working agile or not. This is a disease that we see anywhere. And that's the medical doctor in me speaking, right? And that disease is called multitasking. We still hold the assumption that we can multitask. None of us can. None of us can. Even the, the ladies listening to this podcast or watching this video, you can't do it either, right? We can run multiple things at the same time that we have habits on, that drive basically on autopilot, like talking on the phone and cooking. And I mean, everyone has probably seen this picture and also vacuuming the, car the carpet, but that's all happening on autopilot. But whenever we consciously want to do something and work is always consciously, especially creative work, which like engineering is part of creative work. We can't do multiple things at the same time. And every time we switch between different things, we lose productivity due to context switching. So one of the first advices that I give to people, recommendations that I give to them is take less. Doesn't mean that you don't do all of these things over time. Just don't do them at the same time. And you can run so many simple exercises. And for those of you who are interested to see what kind of exercise to run, we have a free online course called Agile Fundamentals. And maybe, Victor, you can uh, take the link to that in your show notes. It's, it's mod module five of that course. It's about Kanban. And I run a very simple exercise. It doesn't take you more than five to 10 minutes. And then suddenly you will get to the point where, oh man, what have I done all of this time? Like really losing productivity individually, as a team, and as an organization by taking on too many things at the same time. So advice number one, take less focus, stop starting, start finishing. One of the credos of the people working in Kanban. <laughs> that's a very good one. And now when you have a team where uh, that's, let's say distributed and uh, the, the product owner essentially is trying to figure out what everybody's actually working on and when they will actually finish with something certain. Um, and that information just isn't there. Mm -hmm. um, what would you recommend? Or is that almost a disease in itself in wanting to know that very much detailed? I mean, if you really want to know what every single person is working on at any point in time, that probably result or is based on not a lot of trust within the whole team. And I emphasize on within the whole team because you cannot only put it on that one person on the product owner, right? But how do you deal with that, right? How do you create trust where there is no trust? One of the better things to do is to create transparency. And the intention of, for example, a sprint backlog and the intention of the daily scrums is to exactly create that transparency. And based on that transparency that you create, you also create the space for impediments being raised and addressed. 
and you also create the space for alignment to be created. So really taking these two simple things, a sprint backlog looking like a Kanban board, by the way, it can help us also with the previous disease that we talked about, like visualizing how many things are happening in parallel and then reducing that. It can also help you create all of the transparency needed from the product owner side, but also from the side of every other person in that team to see how, how are we making progress? Where can I help and whom can I ask for help? Right. And based on that, become a better team and deliver better products. Mm hmm. And 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 uh, how about when uh, we have lots of bugs or urgent issues that just keep yeah. derailing a sprint, just keep coming up and got to put them in there. And here's my here's my sprint gone. I probably don't, can't even finish the the complete feature, the outcome that I actually wanted to finish in that sprint. Yeah, make it make it visible right in that in that sprint backlog make it visible like this can, has come up and this has come up and our servers are down and this right make it all visible and then make also visible the impact that it has which is as you mentioned victor right we cannot get the features done that we wanted to build in this sprint and not getting the features done probably we're also not getting the outcomes that we wanted to have as as a goal of this sprint and then talk about it in the retrospective, right? Is this just a one-time thing or have these issues come up over and over and over again? And that probably means that our legacy system is probably a big source of disruption. Now, what are we going to do about this? Are we going to take the time to refactor some of those pieces in that legacy system, right? Probably, yes, it's, it becomes a return on investment calculation. If it's just a one-off, all right, you dealt with it, move on. If it happens constantly, you either create a buffer or you start addressing the root cause of this disruption. And, and, and probably a somewhat similar question is um, uh, when I have to keep, keep uh, discussing uh, mid-sprint with people... Um, how things should look like if uh, if the team is not certain uh, about what is being developed and either discussions come up mid sprint and uh, tasks just uh, get bigger or they have to be just reopened because the product owner realizes this is not what they uh, initially wanted to have developed what would you uh, tell a team like that to use common sense <laughs> I mean, no, I'm and we're laughing, right? But because a lot of teams, again, look at this whole thing as, as something mechanistic, right? Oh, but in the sprint planning, we said that we will deliver this. All right. No. During the sprint, in the sprint planning, we had a certain level of visibility. And depending on the product that you're working on, the people that you're working with, sometimes the weather is a bit more, sometimes a bit less foggy. But it is, in general, foggy, right? That's what uncertainty feels like. So now we're in the middle of the sprint. And now we see that on our most important item, there are a few things that we initially forgot to mention. But without those things, it feels incomplete. And it doesn't really deliver value to our clients. So what do we do? Just because we forgot them initially, we just say, no, no, this is now done and please open a new ticket so that I can move on to the next one and then we can talk about this in our next sprint planning. It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? That's where we need to have these individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We talk about it. The product owner says, you know what? It would be great if we could do this on top. And the developer says, you know what? I can do it, but probably the one item that we have currently at the bottom of our sprint backlog, that will fall into the next sprint. And the product owner says, okay, I can live with that. Thank you for letting me know. And that's the kind of collaboration you want to see mid sprint, right? And you don't want to have the debate about, do we open a new ticket or not? Now, depending on the context that you're in, it is clear why these conversations might come up because you have a product owner, which is the company, right? Like trying to build a product. And then you have a supplier 
supplying them with developers. And they are being paid based on, I don't know what, right? The velocity or whatever. You can take out a lot of these debates if you just say, for example, we're paying you per sprint. So mid sprint, we don't have to debate whether this is an initial ticket or not. Because if you're getting paid by the tickets, you would want this to be an initial ticket. So go back to what is incentivizing different types of behavior. And whatever is not an incentive towards better collaboration, try to take it out. Create the contract in a way that it fosters collaboration and doesn't inhibit collaboration. That it fosters building trust to each other and doesn't inhibit building that trust. And I'm not a legal expert, but I've seen a fair amount of contracts in the past, and some of them really incentivize having these debates instead of delivering value. So that's my two cents on this. And, and that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, obviously, fixed price and Scrum or Agile don't really mix well. Um, thank you so much for, for this very enlightening um episode it was it was very very good to hear your thoughts on this um where can we learn more about you personally as well as the scrum academy yeah so our company scrum academy is the host of a bigger platform which is called agile academy also easy to remember agile-academy.com where you not only find the courses and offerings that me and my company offer but also which a lot of our partners offer both live trainings online trainings, a hybrid of those things, because our mission is to make society more productive, more humane, and more sustainable. And given the times that we're in, I think this is so much more important that we try to support this journey that a lot of teams, a lot of organizations, and whole societies are on with the knowledge and experience that we have. So just go to agile-academy.com and you will find more about us. Wow, great. And uh, you, you, you were speaking about um, the Scrum Master coaching, training, the Scrum Master on demand. Is that something your company provides as well? Yes. So we provide the education piece around it. We can also help you with a few coaches that help you in the short run. But our mm -hmm. intention with every company that we work with is to not give them our Scrum Masters for a long period of time, but help them build that capability internally because only that makes it, sustain makes it sustainable. Amazing. Thanks for, for coming on. It was a great show. Thank you, Victor, for hosting me. Great to meet you.